you very much for the introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name, again, my name is Tian Ma. Me and my colleague, Dr. Michael Spagnola, will talk about the common bioequivalence deficiencies in orally inhaled drug product in end submissions. So this disclaimer is for both of us. Uh, this presentation reflects the views of the authors and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policy. So in my part of the presentation, I'll talk about common bioequivalence deficiencies in in vitro pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies in uh, orally inhaled drug product endos. And Dr. Spagnola will talk about common B deficiencies in comparative human uh, clinical endpoint studies. So this is the outline for my part of the presentation. I'll first have an overview of agency's bioequivalence or B recommendations for orally inhaled drug products, which include meter dose inhalers, MDIs, as well as dry powder inhalers, DPIs. Then I'm going to move on to talk about common B deficiencies and B comments for future studies issued in deficiency letters for MDI and DPI endos, which includes deficiencies for in vitro studies, for pharmacokinetic or PK studies, for pharmacodynamic or PD studies, as well as general deficiencies that are applicable for all the B studies. So as Dr. Conti mentioned in her previous presentation, the FDA's B recommendations for MDI product in utilize a weight of evidence approach. So the recommended studies include five in vitro B studies, PK study, PD, or comparative clinical endpoint studies, in addition to formulation and device similarity. The agency's B recommendation for the dry powder inhaler is similar as compared to that for the MDIs. Please note that for the uh, DPIs, the recommended in vitro studies include two studies, which are the single actuation content, SAC, and aerodynamic particle size distribution, APSD studies. Whereas for MDI product, in a, for in vitro studies, in addition to SAC and APSD studies, spray pattern, zoom geometry, and priming and repriming studies are also recommended. For study design in general, we recommend you to follow the recommendations in the product-specific guidance. Differences from the product-specific guidance may be uh, allowed, but it needs justification. And acceptability is evaluated on a case-by-case base, -case basis. And we recommend you to discuss these differences in pre and communication so that you can have an early understanding of the agency's opinion on these differences. So let's move on to talk about common B deficiencies. And let's first start with the general B deficiencies that are applicable to all the following B studies. So one common general deficiency we see is that the test lot used in the B studies do not represent the proposed to be marketed or the commercial product. For example, there may be changes in formulation in device, for example, addition of a dose counter, or manufacturing process, and et cetera. So we recommend you to specify in your application the differences between the test product used in each B studies and the to be marketed pro product. And please also specify the differences between the test product used in each of the B studies. Depending on the differences, additional bridging studies may be needed. And again, we encourage you to discuss these differences in pre and communications so that you can have an early understanding of the agency's opinion on these differences. And you may also conduct the bridging study prior to your end of submissions instead of wait until a deficiency letter is issued. Another general deficiency is regarding to retention samples. Please note that in addition to PK, PD, and comparative clinical endpoint studies, in visual B studies also need retention samples. And Dr. Spagnola will talk about in more details about the retention samples for a comparative clinical endpoint study in his part of the presentation. So let's move on to the common B deficiencies for in vitro studies. As you recall from my earlier slides, uh, these are the five in vitro B studies recommended for the MDI product. And SAC and APSD studies are also recommended for the DPI product. So in this section of my talk, I'll talk about the common B deficiencies related to the method validation and with the uh, pivotal studies. For the method validation, I'll first talk about common deficiencies related to the testing method validation, which is uh, relevant to all of the five in vitro studies. And then I'm going to move on to talk about the analytical method validation for 
HPLC or UPLC, which is related to the SAC, APST, priming, and repriming studies. So let's first start with the common deficiencies for the testing method validation. So we recommend that you to provide the method validation data using the unexpired reference product instead of the test product. And this is because the testing method validation involves drug product performance. So the quality of the products selected to be used in the method validation is critical. The test product at the time of the submission is not yet approved, so it, it may be identified for quality issues in performance or in function during the end of review phase. So this test product is, we have concerns for using this test product in the testing method validation. On the other hand, the reference product is approved product with accepted and known quality. So the agency prefer to use, consider that using this um, reference product more suitable for the test product validation, the method validation. In addition, we recommend you to use the method that is representative of the method used in the pivotal study. For example, the activation method and the analytical mesh procedure should be representative of the ones used in the pivotal study. In cases where your pivotal study was conducted over several days or by several analysts, we also uh, recommend you to conduct an intermediate precision study by day and by analyst to support it. And we also recommend that the acceptance criteria for the method validation should be predefined in the Method Validation Standard Operating Procedure, or SOP. And if your method validation is conducted at a different site as compared to the pivotal study, we recommend you to conduct partial method validation to support the method transfer conducted using the unexpired uh, reference product. So let's move on to the deficiencies for the HPLC or UPLC method validation. Many of these uh, deficiencies are related to incomplete method validation studies. For example, we recommend you to validate accuracy and precision. You may also consider that the lower limit or quantitation, LOQ, to be covered by the linearity study. And again, similar to the testing method validation, if your HPLC or UPLC method validation was conducted at different sites as compared to the pivotal studies, then partial method validations is needed to support your method transfer. For pivotal in vitro studies, many of the deficiencies are related to the missing study information and documents. And as you will hear from for the rest of my talk, you will see that a lot of the deficiencies are related to the missing study information or documents. So for the pivotal studies, we recommend you to clarify in your submission the device orientation setup you used in your pivotal study as well as the method validation studies. We also recommend you to provide SOP that is effective at the time of the study. So not before, not after, but at the time of the study. We also recommend you to provide study data in SAS transfer files instead of other formats, such as PDF formats. For sample repeats, for example, um, reinjections and repeats using the next activation, we recommend you to provide SOP that predefine objective data acceptance criteria. I want to emphasize that the criteria need to be objective. For example, instead of saying that we will reject the sample when we see abnormal value, we would like to see in your SOP how you define abnormal in an objective way. In addition, we recommend you to provide detailed reason of why the original sample were rejected. For example, instead of saying that the sample was rejected due to minor analytical error, we would like to know exactly what happened. For example, doesn't this happen when we were doing this in this process? Also, we recommend you to provide the supporting documents, such as investigational report, to support your sample rejection. For SAC, APSD, and priming and repriming studies, many differences, again, are also related to the missing study information or documents. For example, uh, you may consider submitting 100% raw numerical data for all analytical runs conducted during the HPLC or, or UPLC sample analysis. And I would like to emphasize that we would like to see both accepted and rejected runs. In addition, you may consider provide 20% of serially selected sample HPLC, HPLC or UPLC chromatograms. And please also specify the numbers 
and also the concentrations of the quality control samples used in each of your analytical runs. For spray pattern and plume geometry studies, you just already experienced that sometimes the applicants were not very clear in their submission whether they conducted the study in accordance with the product specific guidance. I'll take this albuterol sulfate MDI as an example. So this is a snapshot from the product specific guidance for albuterol sulfate MDI. For the spray pattern study, it has a statement saying that the selected distance should be at this distance apart and based on the range of this from the reference actuator mouse speed. There's also a footnote saying that the distance between the actuator orifice and point of spray pattern measurement should be the same for test and reference product. So please, in your submissions, specify whether this is the case when you conduct your pivotal studies. So it's clear to us. Additionally, please also uh, provide the intensity profile for spray pattern plume geometry studies and with details listed below. I will not read it uh, due to the time limit. And in addition, for plume geometry studies, please also provide pre-specifications of how plume angle and plume width are determined. So that wraps up the uh, common B deficiencies for in vitro studies. Next, I'm going to talk about the common B deficiencies for PK studies. So for PK studies, uh, you're recommended to address the impact of protocol deviations, such as dosing errors, on the study outcome. And other common B deficiencies we see are actually similar to those PK studies for solid oral dosage form that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. For B deficiencies uh, in PD studies, again, many of them are related to the incomplete study information or study data. For example, we recommend you to specify the formulation of the test and reference placebo product you used in the PD study. You may also consider provide a case report forms for all subjects in the uh, safety population. In addition, for product deviations, uh, you may consider uh, to address the impact of product deviations in the, on the study outcome in your submission. So as a summary of my part of the presentation, I went over multiple common B deficiencies for in vitro PK and PDB studies. And as you can see, many of them are related to the missing study information or missing study documents, which can be prevented by submitting more complete supporting information or supporting data. So with my talk, I hope uh, I can, uh, you can have some, uh, I give you some helpful hint of how to improve your uh, end of submission quality and hope to reduce the numbers of B-related deficiencies in your end of submissions. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Spagnola. Thank you. And for my part,